What's up? I'm B, and whether you are watching this on YouTube or you are listening to the podcast, I hope you are having an amazing day. Today, we are taking a first look into Milena Ciciotti, who is a 26-year-old Michigan-based influencer. I have never covered her on my channel, but over the past probably year and a half or so, I've gotten a few comments of people uh, recommending that I look into her and that I cover her on my channel. And I was like, okay, yep, noted. I'll get around to it eventually. And finally, somebody left a comment saying, uh, Milena put out a two-part series on submission. So I would love to hear your thoughts on it. And I was like, all right, now's my time. Here we go. So I've spent the last week or so looking into her, getting some kind of basic facts on her, and I've watched a few of her videos other than the one that we're going to be reacting to today. And I think it'll be interesting because I don't necessarily have a really strong feeling about her yet one way or the other. I think it's something where I need to look into her further and for a, a longer amount of time for me to really have a grasp on what my opinion is. I think that rings pretty true for any situation where you're being introduced to somebody new, whether it be online or in person, you're not going to know exactly how you feel about them right away. You have to take a little bit of time to kind of get to know them in a sense, you know, if we're talking about me getting to know Milena, it's I need to see more of your content. I need to see more of the things that you're putting out. I, I just got to spend more time watching what she does to really form a strong opinion. But for now, let's just go over some basic facts about Milena. She has 338,000 Instagram followers and 622,000 YouTube subscribers. Her channel was created in 2014, and I went back to watch like the oldest video on her channel, and that one is from 2016, so I'm not sure if she... Um, just like had a YouTube channel or like she had a YouTube account, but she didn't decide to start creating content until 2016 or if she was posting prior to 2016 and then ended up deleting those videos. And if you are someone who has been watching Milena for a long time, please feel free to fill in the gaps because seven years is a really long time to be creating content and I can't exactly catch up with about a week's worth of research. So I would love to hear any additional insight that you have. But in that video that I watched from 2016, it was like a simple make daily makeup routine. And even in that, she didn't talk about being a Christian, but she did share a Bible verse at the beginning of the video. And so what I kind of tried to do was like watch one video from each year, like 2016, one from 2017, one from 2018, and so on. And then a few videos from this past year, just to kind of get an idea of how things may have evolved over time. But like I said, it's pretty consistent that she talks about Jesus. She talks about being a Christian. Um, she's made like a, a video that I watched was about dealing with anxiety. And in that she talked about um, scripture and Christian music and stuff like that. And then I also watched another one where she was saying like, get ready for church with me. And so she just kind of did a vlog before church and then she came home and she shared her notes. So pretty openly been Christian this entire time, but it does seem like she's kind of transitioning from like a like a like a, a cold brew Christian to a crunchy Christian and that might not make sense to you but let me explain it so in my mind like we have some Christian stereotypes of what some Christian women look like and so like a cold brew Christian has the eyelash extensions or the hair extension she wears a wide brimmed felt hat she might be wearing some like shift dresses she probably has a spray tan you know she cares about her appearance and she might carry a Stanley cup that's what I think of when I think about a cold brew Christian. Now, a crunchy Christian, on the other hand, is something that's a little bit newer, something that has kind of emerged in the past few years. It's the kind of Christian woman who fantasizes about homesteading, who makes sourdough. Maybe we could call her a sourdough Christian. I don't know. Crunchy Christian works fine. Um, she has a sourdough starter in her fridge. She is probably doing minimal makeup, natural hair, maybe like baby doll dresses and lots of florals. Somebody who um, wants to do like essential oils for medicine instead of doctors, that kind of vibe. That's kind of what I've seen Milena evolve into, even though I haven't seen a ton of her stuff. It seems like before, I mean, she was posting makeup tutorials. She was really into it. She had a beauty corner, all that stuff. And now 
Um, I watched one of her Instagram stories where she's talking about how she's not buying any new makeup. She's trying to like run through everything she has, but I think she said she has um, like one kind of product left. I don't know if it was a blush or a concealer or whatever, but she's like, this is the only kind that I have. And so once I run out of this, I will buy another one. But if I already have something, like I'm not going to buy more of it. And so she's very much natural and she's talked about like giving up um, the vanity of how she looks and no longer doing Botox and fillers, although there is some conjecture as to whether or not that's exactly accurate. Who am I to say? But so it's just been kind of interesting because she has been a vocal Christian from what I can see since she started creating content, but the way that she practices her faith has evolved over time. And so I think we'll um, have some interesting things to talk about when we watch the video that we're going to watch today, which is submission isn't what we think it is. And I kind of just went off on a tangent because I had some extra notes about her. So let's get back to those. She also has a podcast that she hosts with her husband, Jordan, called As For Me and My House. And the description of it reads as follows. Husband and wife duo Jordan and Milana Ciciati take you on a raw and unfiltered journey through their lives as followers of Jesus and parents of three. Whether they are sharing truth and biblical wisdom, giving relationship advice, or telling funny stories of their dogs, Samson and Delilah, Jordan and Milena seek to exist as a platform for encouragement, love, and support for all who listen. Now, I find this description funny because they named their dogs Samson and Delilah, and um, if you know the story of Samson and Delilah, it's from the Bible. Samson was one of the judges of Israel and he was like designated for greatness before he was born. Uh, basically an angel of the Lord told Samson's parents, hey, you're going to have this blessed child. Like it's going to be a miracle. He's going to have so much strength. Just make sure he never cuts his hair. And then as he goes on, you know, Samson's born. He goes on, he's living his life. He meets and falls in love with a woman named Delilah who um, has an interaction with some of Samson's enemies. And they say like, Hey, we'll give you a ton of silver if you can tell us why Samson is so strong. And so she goes to him and like tries to get him to tell her how he's so strong. Like what's the secret to his strength. And he lies to her a few different times. Like one of the examples is, um, he'll tell her like, Oh, if, if I'm tied up with ropes that have never been used before, then the strength will leave my body. And so he tells that to Delilah. And then that night she ties him up with ropes. And so <laughs> she's like, oh no, the Philistines are here, Samson. And he breaks the ropes because obviously that's not the actual truth. But it's like he knows that she's trying to get this info out of him. Eventually uh, he ends up telling her the truth that if his hair is cut, he will lose his strength. And so she lulls him to sleep and has somebody come in and cut his hair. And then they the Philistines come in and gouge out his eyes. So it's just funny to me that they named one of their dogs Delilah. <laughs> the humor of that aside though, the podcast does have 4.7 stars on Spotify. So clearly it is providing value to some people and they like what they're hearing. Now, Milena also has a website with a blog and her products such as eBooks and home organization PDFs, as well as a link to her Amazon storefront. And I want you to hear a little bit about who Milena is in her own words. So I'll go ahead and read you the about me section from that website. On her website, it says, welcome friend. Hey sister, thanks for being here as a wife, mom of three and entrepreneur. I know your time is valuable. I want to encourage you to take a moment to rest in this truth. God loves you just as you are. Right now, nothing added. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any more than he already does. Now that you've gotten your daily dose of spiritual encouragement, let me tell you a little more about myself in case you're new here. I am first and foremost an unashamed Bible-believing follower of Jesus. I believe God's word is sufficient for all instruction for living a life pleasing to God. Since I am committed to making Jesus the center of my life, Everything else flows from that relationship of unconditional love and unapologetic truth. Prayerfully, you'll see and witness that here. Although I was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I moved to Michigan, USA when I was only three years old. At 15, I met my high school sweetheart, Jordan. We knew from our very first date that we were going to get married, and five years later, on June 25th, 2017, we tied the knot. We are so thankful that the Lord brought us together and for all he has done since. From our union, we now have three little bundles of joy earthside and one in heaven. 
From a professional perspective, I originally went to college to study early childhood development, but my plans drastically changed when God opened the door for my YouTube channel to grow. Jordan and I also host a podcast together called As For Me and My House, where we go into greater detail about life, marriage, and parenting through a biblical worldview. I cannot even begin to put into words how honored, grateful, and humbled I am to receive messages, emails, and letters daily from people all over the world stating that the content I make brings them closer to the Lord. All the glory to Him. I literally could not do what I do without your love and support. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. Be blessed. Now, like I said, on this website, you can see her blog, her eBooks, her digital downloads, like her PDFs and her Amazon storefront. And I was really interested in seeing the pricing of those eBooks because sometimes people will put out (laughs) digital products that are a ridiculously high price for completely no reason other than they want to price it super high. Um, But looking at her products, she has one, I think it's like a nine day Bible study and it's $9.99. And then there's a book about putting on the armor of God, which is $7.99. So I'd have to actually read the eBooks to see if I felt that they were worth that price. But I've definitely paid more for a book on Kindle. So seeing that pricing doesn't immediately stand out to me as something that's like, oh my gosh, why would she do that? You know, but what I was also really interested in was seeing her blog and reading some of the things that she put on there. Milena has recipes on this blog. And I was like, I like to cook. Let's take a look. And I'm... (laughs) I can't help, like, I just, I can't help but laugh, okay? Look, (laughs) let me just show you and you'll understand why. Last month, Milena posted a recipe for creamy crockpot chicken gnocchi soup. And I was like, bet, I love gnocchi. Let's take a look. And the first thing that caught my eye is the picture that she included of this soup along with the ingredients because the third ingredient that's listed says three to four medium carrots peeled and chopped. If you're watching this, look at this picture. Look at this picture. Those are baby carrots. That is not, (laughs) that's not three to four medium carrots peeled and chopped. Those are whole baby carrots. (laughs) I don't know about you, but the thought of a whole baby carrot in soup does not sound um, super appealing to me. I would much rather have the chopped carrots, but I don't know. Maybe maybe this was all she had. And she was like, well, they'll understand that like typically I use chopped carrots. But right now, like I just have these baby carrots and I'm short on time. So I'm not going to like cut them up. I don't know. Who knows? To each their own. Whatever works for you and your family. I feel like other people might not find this as funny as I do, but I spent so much time thinking about it yesterday that I was like, I have to include it. Like I have to talk about this. I need someone else to be exposed to this. Like I need you to read what I am reading because there's another recipe for her, her family's favorite stuffed bell peppers. Okay. And here are the ingredients, two pounds of ground beef and pork mix, 11 peppers, salt and pepper, Italian seasoning, and Mexican blend shredded cheese. Right off the bat, I'm like, okay. Um, seems like a little bit bland. Also, how much Italian seasoning do we need? If I were going to make stuffed peppers, I would also probably include something like minced garlic, maybe an onion, um, potentially some tomato paste to mix in with the meat. Like I think that would be good. Just thinking about like how I would make stuffed peppers. I'm like, okay, I feel like ingredients are a little bit lacking here, but let's go ahead. Let's see the instructions. First instruction Saute peppers over olive oil for about five minutes. Are we doing the whole peppers? Like just take 11 whole bell peppers and we're sauteing them in olive oil? Okay, okay. Add ground beef and pork and mix. (laughs) Add ground... (laughs) Add ground beef and pork to mix and cook until it's 90% cooked. Okay, so we're adding ground beef on top of whole bell peppers... Add salt, pepper, and Italian seasoning, okay? While that's cooking, cup the tops of the peppers off to make a bowl. Okay, so I guess we're removing the bell peppers from the pan that we were sauteing them in and we're cutting them. Okay, okay. (laughs) Place those peppers in an oven-safe dish and stuff the peppers with your meat mix. Bake at 350 for 20 to 25 minutes. No mention of the cheese. What do we do with the cheese? Do we mix it in to the meat mixture? Do we put it on top? You said we needed the Mexican blend shredded cheese, and yet there's no mention of it. 
Now, I know that poorly written out recipes are not like a criminal offense. I know that it seems a little bit silly to get hung up on them. But in thinking about the way that Milana presents herself on the internet, it makes me feel like it's a little bit disingenuous. Like she's purposely like presenting herself as caring about certain things or like certain things being very valuable to her that really they don't matter to her and she's just posting like they do because it's for her persona on the internet. Like she thinks that she should care about these things or she thinks that she should be good at these things. And so it's like, well, this is my persona. This is like the kind of um, like presentation of myself that I've cultivated on the internet. So this is what I'm going to post. And I also think that because in some of her older videos, she was talking about how she is not a good cook about how she lived at home until her and Jordan got married and she was like working full time. So she had been saving that entire time. Um, And like financially, she's very savvy, it seems like. But that whole time she was living at home, she was like her mom was cooking for her. And she's like, I miss my mom's cooking so much. And it was really, really hard once I moved out to be like, oh, I have to grocery shop. Like we, we have to do this. We have to cook. We have to plan our meals out together. Like that was something that was hard for her to adjust to. And so, yeah, things can change over time. But if cooking's not your forte, like if it's not something that you're super passionate about, don't be like, here's a recipe I made. Want to follow it? I can understand wanting to make good, nourishing, home-cooked meals and like wanting to get better at something and feeling like, I want, you know, healthy food for my kids and I want to nourish them and I really want to like cook at home as much as I can and like making that a priority. But why don't you just share recipes from other people? Why don't you be like, I followed this recipe from this person and it was great. I love it. Instead of just being like, here's my recipe and then posting stuff that doesn't even make sense. Riddle me that one. Anyway, that's kind of your bare bones intro into who Milena Ciciotti is. We're going to go ahead and move on to reacting to part one of her two-part video series on submission. If we watch this and there's a lot to talk about and you guys want me to do part two, absolutely feel free to let me know because I want to put out content that you want to see. But before we get into the reaction, let's go ahead and do win for the week. If you are new around here, a win for the week is where you share something good that happened to you over the past week that you would consider a win. It could be big or small, whatever it may be, just something that made you happy, something that made you feel grateful, something that brought you joy. I want to hear about it. And so if you're watching the YouTube video, you can leave it in the comments section. Or if you are listening to the podcast on Spotify, you can leave it in the Q&A section for this particular episode. My win for the week is that my car is finally getting fixed. I was rear-ended a few weeks ago and I don't know if it has anything to do with like this specific collision center or the insurance that the other person has or what, Um, but they basically had to do the estimate and then wait for the check to come in from the insurance company that matched the estimate and then they were going to order the parts And then once the parts came in, I could drop the car off. And so we had to wait a few weeks, but everything's finally lined up. I was able to drop my car off. I have a rental in the meantime with heated seats, which I love. Heated seats and a moonroof. So I'm I'm real happy about that. And soon I should have my car back. So that is my win for the week. I cannot wait to hear yours and celebrate with you. And without any further ado, let's get into this reaction. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just cut out the first like 20 seconds of this video because it is like vlog style footage of Milena and Jordan and their kids and they are like cooking dinner in the kitchen together and then they're sitting down and eating and then it's Milena and Jordan um, sitting on the couch reading together and it's all just with music in the background. There's no um, like voiceover or anything that I think is important to the rest of the video. So just cause it has our kids in it, I'm going to cut it out. I don't know what the rest of the video is going to look like. Um, but if it's footage of her kids, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. There might be a lot of blurring going on. Um, but right now there's a verse on the screen that says an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. Proverbs 12, four. Hello, you guys. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to today's video where we are going to be talking about a very heavy topic. 
we are going to be talking about submission and this will not be the first time I talk about this. I really do want this to be more of an intro into this subject. I think a lot of people have very mixed feelings about this word submission and I'm going to specifically be talking about it in the context of marriage and what a wife should do to her own husband. I have found so much freedom in this topic. I have found so much beauty in this topic and I think for the longest time I let the wrong ideas that the world has to say about submission, what the world says and how the world has twisted and distorted what God created and has used it for such vain and self-pleasure and just vile things that just do not glorify the Lord. And so I think this word submission is a hard one for some of us to hear and even want to wrap our mind around the idea of doing something like this because of how the world has distorted and how sinful fallen people have distorted it. But if we look at what the Bible says and if we look at what God specifically and so beautifully created and designed signed, it's so flawless. It is a perfect imagery between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the perfect imagery between Christ loving the church. It's just, there's so much symmetry, there's so much resemblance, and there's so much beauty and power in this. And of course, the enemy would take something that God so beautifully designed and would distort it to what it is and what people assume that it is. So I know a lot of us have a lot of baggage. I know a lot of us have worldly fathers or worldly people in our lives, sinful people. We all fall short. So I know we all have a preconceived idea of what this word submission even means. So I just want to maybe just take a second now to see what it is that you have thought of this word that is unbiblical. What are your preconceived notions? preconceived experiences? What are some things that have stopped you from seeing this word submission as nothing more than a gateway into freedom and into obedience to the Lord? Because I think until we do that, we will constantly hit a roadblock. Until we realize that we cannot submit with our own strength, that we truly need the Holy Spirit, it will be really hard for us to realize that we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be more Christ like and to be submissive to our husbands. So let's jump in, shall we? This will definitely be a part two or a part three to this because I have so much to unpack. And in this episode, I really want to dig and unpack what the Bible says. And then I'm thinking in the next coming episodes, I can kind of unpack what that has looked like for me personally, because the biggest issue that I've had with submission is truly not understanding what that looks like day to day because submission. Okay. So I am having a little bit of trouble with the way that, like, from from a, a production standpoint, the way that this is being done. If you are listening to this, it is just footage of Milena, her husband, her kids, like, in the kitchen still. It's just, like, the camera set up and they're in there doing things in the kitchen. And then she is doing this as a voiceover. And it does not sound to me like this is a prepared voiceover, like there are notes, but there are bullet points that she is hitting. It's just kind of like a stream of consciousness. And that is making it very difficult for me to follow along and like process really what she's saying. Yeah, I understand that she's talking about submission and how people have resistance to it. And um, she thinks there's freedom in submitting to submission and like being open to it. And she's going to talk about it. Great. Yes, I I understand the general concept of what she's saying, but it is a little bit difficult for me to focus and for me to process on like the finer points that she may or may not be hitting. So I hope that that's going to change at some point. I don't know if it will, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed. And I guess before she gets too deep into it, um, I'll go ahead and just kind of share my perspective on submission because that is something that is spoken about in the Bible. There are Bible verses that say wives submit to your husbands, but um, when when that concept is presented, it is also followed by a uh, some some version of wives submit to your husbands, and husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church, and so in in a lot of English versions of the Bible, it does say wives submit to your husbands. And I think that that word, like, like submission or submit, does kind of throw up a lot of defensiveness in people of like, 
excuse me? Like, what do you mean? Like, I, I have to submit like a child. Like, I don't get to make my own decisions. And I know for me, for a long time, I did have that defensiveness because whenever that concept was presented, that's just kind of what it felt like I was being told to do by the church or by church leadership is like, you don't get to make your own choices. Once you are married, you defer to someone else. And I think that that's a little bit misguided. This is all my opinion, how I feel and how I see things. I will say this a million times over. I am not a biblical scholar. I don't know everything. Like you're free to disagree with me if you see it differently. That's totally fine. But how I see it is this concept of mutual trust and respect for one another. Submission to me does not look like not having an opinion, uh, being told what to do, not getting to make my own choices, and like just kind of being the one to defer all the time to like, well, I have to submit. So I guess what I want doesn't matter. Like that's not what it looks like to me. And that is not how um, I behave, frankly, in my marriage of like, oh, well, just whatever, whatever my husband wants. I see it as like a symbiotic relationship. And there are certain things where my husband and I kind of fall into more traditional gender roles. Um, like in terms of like a husband being a protector, I definitely look at my husband like that. Like I count on him for that and I feel safer when he is around. And so it's like, I respect him. I look to him as somebody who has good judgment. I use him as my sounding board. I like run ideas by him if I'm not really sure how I feel about something. And really like when you say those things out loud, it kind of just sounds like um, a relationship where you value the other person, how they feel and what they think. And I think that that's kind of like the heart of submission is understanding that you are in a partnership with someone and it's not all about you. You don't get to do what you want all the time. You don't get to always make every choice for yourself regardless of how somebody else feels about it. When you're single, you can do whatever you want. Like you are free to make those choices. You don't have to check in with somebody. You don't have to defer to somebody. You don't have to be like, oh, let me check in with my partner and see how they feel about it. You can make every single choice on your own that you want to make. But when you commit to a marriage, you are giving that up. You just are because you can't, you can't be in a healthy long-term partnership where you don't care about how somebody else feels. You have to say like, we are entering this partnership. We are becoming teammates even more so than we were before. And so I care how you feel about something. I care what your opinion is. I may not agree with something if like, I don't know, like if I, if I want to make a decision and my husband is like, I don't really agree with that, then I could in theory be like, well, oh, well, but is that right? Like, is that indicative of somebody who was wanting to be in a partnership with somebody? No, it, it's rude and it's disrespectful to just dismiss someone else's feelings. If you are in a marriage, you have to be willing to have that space emotionally for someone else. And so that's kind of how I feel about submission is it's not just like, well, I don't get to make a choice. Like, you know, be, me being a female, I'm like, well, I don't get to make a choice. I have to submit. No, it's I can still make choices. I can have my own thoughts. I can make my own decisions. But as somebody who is one half of this team, I want to make sure I'm checking in with my teammate. I want to make sure that whatever choices are being made, whether it's finances, vacation, uh, like lifestyle changes, whatever it may be, that we're on the same page and that we are understanding and respecting each other. And to me, that is the heart of submission. But let's see what Milena has to say about it. Submission does not look like being quiet and not having an opinion and not being able to say how you're feeling. That's not what submission okay. is. And so I had a very weak understanding of what that meant. And so I think that made it really hard for me to overcome that. But by the grace of God and through the Holy Spirit, I feel like I've gotten to a place where I have a true understanding of what that means. And I've been able to apply that to my marriage and it has given me so much freedom. So that is what I will be talking about in part two. But let's unpack a lot okay. of what the Bible says today. So 
if you have your Bibles with you, let's open up to Ephesians 5. Ephesians is probably one of my favorite books in the Bible because it is just so rich with information and just shows us exactly what we are supposed to live like in our life with Christ. So if you go to Ephesians 5, 22. He's specifically talking about wives and husbands. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head as the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, so that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife Hi. loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Christ does to the church church because we are members of his body therefore a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this mystery is profound and i am saying that it refers to christ and the church whoever let each one of you love his wife as himself and let his wife see that she is respected however let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she is respects her husband now this is so profound there's so much on here. And then in the next one, it even talks about children obeying their parents. And there's a theme. I think the biggest thing that we don't realize is that there's a theme of submission. We, as followers of Christ, are to submit to our Father. If you get married, you are to submit to your husband. I didn't really know what to expect when going into this video because I also saw a video where um, she was talking about how she has decided to take away like worldly entertainment from her children because Elsa from Frozen is a witch and it was like causing her kids to have nightmares. And so I was like, okay, that's a lot. Like that's a little bit extreme. Um, so I wasn't quite sure what we were going to see with this. We are still, you know, not very far into the video. But I appreciate that she is sharing more of this passage um, than just wives submit to your husbands, which generally is like as far as Paul and Morgan will get when they are talking about the topic on YouTube. So off to a decent start. I, I, I have a little bit of hope, but I also feel like someone who watches my channel would not have recommended this to me if there wasn't like something else that's going to come along that I have like a visceral reaction to. So we'll see. Husband who is under the authority and submission of Christ and under you, once you become a parent, your children are to submit to you. There's a very specific rule and we're called to submit to our authorities and to the governments. There's a very specific theme and rule and think of it as like an umbrella. It's a beautiful representation <gasps> of being covered by God. Not an umbrella. <gasps> Are we getting IBLP vibes? Is she talking about like Bill Gothard's umbrella of protection? For those who are unfamiliar with Bill Gothard or the IBLP, Bill has presented this um, kind of like image of how leadership should go in Christ following families where you have an umbrella of protection. There's God at the top and then there's the father of the home, the mother and the children. And if you step out from under the protection that's above you, then that's when Satan's going to come snatch you up. And um, really like this, this hierarchy of authority has pretty much been used to perpetuate abuse and toxic relationships and to cause a lot of harm for those who follow the Institute in Basic Life Principles and Bill Gothard. Uh, I talked about this a lot more in my video on shiny happy people and so if you've not seen that video I'll link it in a pinned comment that way you can go watch it after. I don't know if Milena is getting into IBLP like I don't know if if she's referring to an umbrella in that sense or if somebody else has kind of given her that illustration. So I'm not sure if it's really like fundamental to understanding what she's going to say in this video that you know more about the IBLP, but we'll see. Like I would probably recommend just going and watching it after because I don't know how much those beliefs are going to play a role in the rest of this video. 
bed. And then under that, you have your husband and he's covering you. And then you and your husband are covering your children. It's like this beautiful representation of comfort and peace and joy, all the fruits of the spirit. And so when we read that, I don't want us to go to a place of seeing what we can't do, but I want you to think of how the Holy Spirit can work through you to be able to do this. Let's open up to 1 Timothy. Let's look at 1 Timothy Timothy 2. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Let's also read Colossians 3.18. Rules for a Christian household. So that's 1 Timothy 2 verse 11. Okay, so I am starting to see why someone might recommend that I watch and react to this video in particular. I don't know a ton about First and Second Timothy, which are two books in the New Testament of the Bible, but just doing like a cursory Google search, First Timothy was written by Paul. Paul is somebody who has written a lot of letters to religious leaders and churches uh, like that are aiming to follow the teachings of Jesus and like are in the process of being established essentially. That's kind of like the broad perspective on why Paul wrote these letters is like encouragement for new churches as they are being created. Um, But just in doing like a Google search of 1 Timothy chapter 2, I have a ton of Websites coming up, the Junia Project, Enduring Word, Bible Ref, First Baptist Church in Thompson, Georgia, Christians for Biblical Equality International, the Gospel Coalition, Insight for Living, GotQuestions.org, like so many websites coming up to give commentary and speculation on why Paul would have said what he said in chapter 2. And like one of the theories, I, again, like this is just me doing a basic Google search. I have not looked into this prior to just now. I have not looked into this specific set of verses until just now. So I would have to do a lot more um, digging before like forming a strong opinion. But one of the resources I saw, because I was like browsing through it, said that the word that um, Paul used originally really meant peaceful instead of quiet. I also saw a specific mention of um, in 1 Timothy 2 verse 9 when Paul says, and I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. That, according to one of the sources that I read, was specifically talking about people going to worship, like going to worship events and ceremonies and dressing in a way that was like, look at me. Like, I want to be opulent. I want you to know my status. Look at me instead of like just coming to focus on worshiping God. And so that is one theory as to why Paul said that. It's like, no, like don't draw attention to yourself, you know, dress nice, whatever, but like come and and really the focus should be on worship, not on how fancy you look, not on how nice you look. I also saw another explanation, which is really interesting, but also pretty complex. And so I don't want to um, do it a disservice by explaining it poorly or being like, here's kind of like what I think it said, or here's a summary based on me reading through it one time. Um, But I will link it in the description box in case you want to read it and check it out because that explanation is really, really interesting. Um, But again, like I, I, this is the first time that I am looking into deeper context of first Timothy chapter two. And so I don't really have an answer of like, well, here's what I think it means. But I will say that there are plenty of explanations as to what Paul means and giving additional context and saying like, here's why he may have said these things, or here's what the original language may have been referring to, which I think is important to consider. I don't like when people just throw a verse out there and they say like, this is what you got to do. Like, this is what it means because we can see by spending five minutes on Google, there are 10 different explanations as to what that those words that Melana just read might mean. So I'm assuming, I mean, she said what uh, 
Corinthians or Colossians that she's going to read out of next, I'm going to assume that we're going to have a similar situation where it's like, okay, you're just reading verses that refer to submission and you're not looking further into them. You're not going to tell us who wrote them, why they wrote them, with what context they wrote them. Like we're not going to get that additional information that is really crucial to somebody who wants to have a deeper understanding of the Bible, like of this book that Christians are using to basically say like, this is my source of knowledge. Everything in the Bible is useful for learning and instructions on how to live your life. But I'm just going to read it at face value and assume that um, in 2023, I'm getting the full, the full scope. I'm getting the full picture of what was meant when this was written thousands of years ago in another language. It's amazing how within two minutes of Milena's video, we went from like, I got you, I'm on track, I'm open to it, to me being like, oh no, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Wives, submit to your husband as it is fitting unto the Lord. Husband, love your wife and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Let's also flip over to 1 Peter 3. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respect and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of the hair and the putting of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be hidden in the person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how a holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children." If you do good and not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in the understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Last one here is... Okay. I'm reading a different version of the Bible than she is, but again, like we, she's just kind of rattling off verses, not giving additional context that's frustrating like if you're trying to instruct people i think a responsible choice would be to like dig deeper into the verses and not just be like oh and this one and this one and this one um but i do think it's interesting because she got to the point where it said she may be weaker than you but in my version it says she may be weaker I, i'm using the new living translation or the nlt and this is first peter three Verse 7, it says, In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. And like her version didn't really include that part of like, I, I, to me, like just upon first reading, again, I have not looked into the exact context of this specific verse because I didn't know what was going to be in Milena's video, uh, but it says like she may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner. So I think maybe that's generally just talking about like physically she might be weaker than you are, but like emotionally and in this relationship, y'all are partners. So like make sure that you are, you know, treating her as you should. So your prayers will not be hindered. It's Titus, Titus 2. And now Paul is talking to giving qualifications. The book of Titus is just such a good book. But Paul is okay, talking so to these Paul. people and he's giving them a whole cool. qualification of like what needs to happen to get their whole thing together because they're they're falling apart here. And so he's giving very specific things and he has quite a lot to say about men. So if you're ever curious about what to pray for for your husband, I would definitely look into the book of Titus because it gives really specific things as to what a man should be doing. But in Titus 2, it's talking to older women. It says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. Then the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, urge 
the younger men to be self-controlled. And then it continues on saying things about what men should be doing. If I were you, I think it would be so wise to kind of go back through and read those verses and really meditate on them. There's very specific commands for women and there's very specific commands for men. But nowhere does it say that a woman needs to have her husband doing X, Y, and Z before she submits. And nowhere does it say that a man needs to have his wife be doing X, Y, and Z before he loves her. These things are not conditional upon action. These things are not conditional upon what our husbands are not doing or doing. Now, this is a statement I need to make. I think it might be obvious, but if you are in a abusive relationship, you are not subject to submit. You are to go to authorities. You are to go to your church. Abuse is not acceptable. It is not okay. And if your husband is using submission as a way to manipulate you into staying into abuse, you need to leave now. So this is not for women. Just because a video is online for all the world to see does not mean what I am saying here applies to everyone in the world. What I am saying... Thank goodness. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Religious influencers tend not to say that. They tend not to go there. We recently saw a video with Paula Morgan where they were like, oh, well, we know that there are some situations where people are in abusive relationships, but we're not going to talk about it. And that made me real angry. And so for her to get on here and be like, we're going to talk about submission and like, you know, you don't have to meet a certain standard for your husband to love and care for you and they shouldn't have to meet a certain standard for you to submit to them. While I might have like certain qualms or like be nitpicky about the words that we're using there for her to just blatantly be like, but hey, if you're in an abusive relationship, this does not apply to you. Get out, go to the authorities. I like that one though. She gets a point in my book for outwardly and boldly and plainly condemning abuse because it's wild to me, but there are a lot of Christian influencers who won't do that. So I'm glad we got that one. Like that's, that's a win for me. Isn't it sad that I'm sitting here watching a religious influencer and being like pleasantly surprised that she is openly denouncing abuse? That realization just registered in my brain, and that is very disheartening. Ooh, I don't like I don't like how that feels. That I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, you go, girl. Thank you for saying that abuse is not okay. Ugh, we gotta do better. Like, seriously, as Christians, and this is aimed at Paul and Morgan. Christians with influence and with a young audience, like you got to do better. <laughs> Expand your beliefs. I don't I don't know how they feel about it because it seems like they want to avoid that topic every time it could potentially come up of them being like, oh, well, we know like abuse happens, but really the only biblical reason for a divorce is infidelity. <sighs> Look into it, figure it out. Like, ooh, we got to do better. That. <laughs> Mm. here today applies to a man and a woman who have taken a covenant before God. This applies to you if you are in a healthy relationship. Now, I am not going to tell you what is abusive and what is not abusive. This is going to distract okay. from the video. I highly suggest that you talk to an elder in your church. I highly suggest you talk to an older woman, a Titus II woman. I highly suggest that you talk to others, not your girlfriends, not your mother. You need to go to someone into the church and to authorities and seek help in that area. So if you find yourself in that shoe of being in a relationship that is abusive, this does not apply to you. But those of us who are in a marriage and our husbands are probably... Okay, I disagree with that a little bit. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to go to someone in the church because sometimes church authorities, uh, depending on like how high control your church is, will be like, no, that's not abuse. Um, and they'll like downplay it and be like, like they'll try and um, blame the woman or say like what did you do how did you provoke him were you being a disobedient wife like were you being unchristian and so you had to be corrected and that's not for every church I'm not saying that that would happen in every single situation um, but it has happened I mean it it's happened before where people who are trying to 
express harm that's been done to them and like seeking guidance from their leadership have been made to feel like they're the ones at fault. Um, and again, it's just, it just depends on your church and the leadership that you have. I'm not saying that that's the case for everybody, but, um, I do think it's fine to go, go to your mom, go to your friends, go to people who, you know, care about you and be like, if you're unsure, be like this thing happened, I don't know how I feel about it because those people who actually love you and care about you are going to be like, oh, that's not okay. And they're going to validate how you feel. They're going to help you understand that like you're not overreacting. This thing, whatever it was, you know, in theory, I think in most cases, if you're questioning whether or not something was abusive, it probably is. Like your gut is telling you that's not okay. That's not right. And so people who love you and care about you can help you validate that and reassure you that you're not overreacting. You're not being overdramatic. What you experienced is real and it's not okay. And those people have a real investment in making sure that you're all right and doing what they can for you as opposed to leaders of a church who might, um, depending on, on who your spouse is, might have more of um, a motivation to protect the spouse or to take the spouse's side. Again, not in all situations, but just in some, like that, that can happen. A little bit lazy sometimes, or they don't take the trash out right away when we ask them to, or they watch more video games than they should. This applies to you. Now, it's hard to talk about submission without talking about the idea of taming the tongue. And we see this theme all throughout Proverbs. And if you have not read through Proverbs, I just cannot recommend it enough. It talks about in Proverbs 12 4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. Can we marinate that for a second? So if our husbands are our head and we are the authority to them, God is telling us that an excellent wife is a crown. We're our husband's crown. He gets to wear us with such beauty and such glory. But one who brings shame is rottenness in his bones. We have the ability to see the type of wife that we want to be. And if you're not getting your definition of what an excellent wife is from nothing more than the Bible, then you need to reevaluate what you think is an excellent wife. The world has completely distorted what a wife is to be and not to be. And if it doesn't come from God's truth, then it is not truth and it is false doctrine and you need to throw it away in the trash. Proverbs 31 is probably the most well-known okay. verses that talks about what being a wife is like. And she is a woman who fears the Lord. That is what a submissive wife does. She fears the Lord and has more authority and more of a understanding and want to serve the Lord more than her husband. Wives, you did not marry Jesus. Your husband is not going to be your knight in shining armor. We cannot hold our husbands to the standard of being perfect and blameless like Christ. We did not marry Christ. We married a sinful fallen human. So when he fails, why are we surprised? Our calling is not to sit here and shame and point fingers and try to correct him. Our goal is to go to the secret place and pray for them because first Peter tells us that our husbands will we be won over not by a single word, but by our actions and how we live a reverent life. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 19, 14. House and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I read this today and I swear my world was rocked. So I was like, a prudent wife is from the Lord. I was like, what does prudent even mean? Prudent is being slow to speak and process through before sharing. Proverb talks at length about the power of the tongue. This two-inch thing that we have in our mouth, the smallest little thing, has the absolute power to completely slash your husband in half, or it has the power to completely grow him and water him and grow him into this giant flower. Are you going to use your tongue to completely slash and de-weed and completely break apart the tree that your husband is, or are you going to use it to water it and to speak life over it and let him flourish and flourish and flourish and blossom into this beautiful beautiful tree. One of the fruits of the spirit. Okay. I, I don't know. Maybe that's something that she's never considered before, but I think a lot of people learn pretty early on that 
Um, you know, a common phrase in like elementary school is, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But really, like we understand pretty early on that words can be pretty hurtful. Like the things that you say can impact somebody. And, you know, it's a common sentiment of like somebody might not remember the exact words that you used when you were speaking to them, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And so, I, I don't know, maybe that is something that she is really learning for the first time today, but it seems kind of shock. I don't know, not shocking to me, but it's like, really? Like, that's the first time you've thought about the power that your words have is when you read that verse today? Hmm. I don't, like, I, I don't know. I don't believe it, especially just because I have seen um, her talking about, like, gentle parenting and like the way that I have seen her interact with her kids. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors, but it does seem like she is a very patient mom and she's a mom who speaks to her kids kindly and and gently. Like, again, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, but it's like you have the, the wherewithal to understand the concept of gentle parenting and talk about how you do that and like seeing how you interact with your kids it seems like you're pretty, um, again, like just kind and understanding with them and patient. So I think you probably knew. Like I think you know that your words impact how other people feel and your words have the the ability to impact how your husband feels about himself. Here is to be self-controlled, not people controlling or husband controlling. We are to control ourselves. When we take on the role of controlling our husbands, we are in the power and very much so similar to Jezebel. Now, if you're not familiar with Jezebel, I would go back to 1 Kings and read what this awful woman did. But Jezebel is one of the most despicable women in the Bible. And it is how wow. 99% of our world and women run today. There are so many characteristics wow. that Jezebel had and possessed that we see in women in relationships and husbands and the way that they talk to their husbands, the way that they treat their husbands very much so today. And it's very interesting to me that Jezebel is mentioned in First Kings. But if you also go to Revelation, she's also mentioned in the very back of the book. She's mentioned in the end times and she is unrepented of her sins and her sexual immoralities. In Revelation 20 is where it talks about her, but she's unrepentive and she does not have any self-control. She's manipulative. She wants to dominate. She wants to cause fear. She's discouraging. She's sexually immoral. She uses her beauty and makeup and like all of these outwardly things to subdue and have someone submit to her. Very sexual, very lustful. Uses it as a way to manipulate. She wants to be in leadership. And she's unrepentive. She is unrepentive of her sins. If any of those words would be a way to describe you, sister, you need to get on your knees right now and you need to repent of these sins. You need to go to the church just like the Bible commands us to do to repent our sins upon one another so that our prayers may not be hindered, so that the Lord can hear them, so that the righteous prayers are heard. These are things that our world does today that you cannot tell the difference between a believer and the world. It is crept so deep into the church, my friends, that you cannot distinguish the difference between a godly woman and a worldly woman. And it is scary. My like verse of the year, the one that I've just been clinging on to has been Proverbs 15. And it says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise command knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out fully. What if we took what Proverbs says and actually applied it into our marriage? What if we took what God's word says and lived it out day in and day out? And this is not easy and we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. But praise the Lord, we have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit works through us. Our job, and the Bible makes it very clear, it's not to control. It's not to dictate and be the judge of whether our husbands are worthy of our submission. Our job is to submit to our husbands regardless of when they are falling short. They will fall short, sisters. But we need 
to be okay. And we need to have a larger fear of wanting to submit to our Lord. Because here's the thing. When you say that you won't submit to your husband because he's not leading you well, or when you say he's not worthy of your submission, when you say all of these things, you're ultimately telling the Lord that I don't trust you, Lord. Lord, you can't do it. Okay, so Milena, not the biggest fan of Jezebel, which I, I understand. I'm on board with you. She was manipulative. She was a liar. She was the wife of King Ahab. Um, and just, she just did like a lot of shady things. So I got you. We're on the same page there. Um, but as far as her like just talking about being able to submit when you feel that your husband is not leading you well. I can understand that sentiment. Like everybody's imperfect. We are all human. We are all going to um, just have like times in our lives where we are not at our best or where we are going through something tough or where we need like other people's guidance or help to kind of get us back on the right track. And so like just because your husband might be going through a tough time or um, not like, like, like he's just going through a rough patch and he's not really at his best. He's not on his A game doesn't mean that you just get to disrespect and disregard how he feels or his opinions. Like I'm totally, I'm, I'm with that. I support that. But I think it's really, really interesting that that's a concept I have heard multiple times throughout my life. I don't really ever hear the opposite. I don't ever hear people talking about, and if your wife isn't living up to the standard that you think she should live up to, still make sure that you're respecting her and still make sure that you're protecting her. And I don't really know what the reasoning behind that is. I don't know if it's that, um, that like the need for that hasn't really become common in churches. Like people don't need to say that because the general trend is that women do want to be good wives and like they're trying their best and like they're doing what they can um or if it's just that like churches are interested in like protecting men not protecting them but being proactive and advocating for them and i i do generally think that in a lot of cases men are put on this pedestal in religions but then they're not really expected to live up to it. Like they have the power, they have the authority, they're in charge, but they're still incredibly fallible to the point that like modesty is such an important thing to talk about because you don't want to cause your brothers in Christ to sin. And it's like, well, if they're so powerful and they're so important and like they, uh, they have the authority to make these decisions and we're supposed to look up to them, shouldn't they be able to like see cleavage and, and be all right? You know, like men are put on these, on this elevated level but then they're not expected to live up to it. Like people will make excuses of, well, just because he's not living up to it doesn't mean he doesn't deserve it. And that's not the messaging that everyone's going to get everywhere they go. But as someone who has been involved in religious circles and Christianity, literally since I was born, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of different stuff and been exposed to a lot of different ways of thinking and leadership styles and stuff like that. And so I do think it's quite interesting that there's conversations of even if your husband doesn't live up to what he's supposed to, you still have to respect him. But it's not really presented on the opposite end of the spectrum. There's no conversations really about and if wives don't live up to what you expect of them, you still need to respect them and, and treat them well. Just something I noticed. You are putting and accusing the Lord of not being the Lord of the Lords and Kings of Kings. You are ultimately saying that God does not have the ability to change. The Lord is the Kings of Kings. Your husband's heart. Not only that, but then it, the pride sneaks in because what if it's you that needs to change? What if it's you that has to submit first? What if it's something in us that we're not seeing because we're so busy pointing our fingers at our husbands? This is so humbling. And so oftentimes I have found myself in situations where Jordan and I had an argument. There was a moment where I did not want to tame my tongue. There's a moment where all I wanted to do is just word vomit all of these awful things out. And what I do is I just take them straight up to the Lord and I say, Lord, you are the Lord and I have full submission. I fully surrender my marriage to you. There is so much freedom in surrendering our marriage to God because that tells him like, hey, 
I can't do this, so I'm giving it to you. I need your strength. I need the Holy Spirit to help me and to guide me in this. And there's so much freedom in that because we no longer have to control. We no longer have to micromanage. We no longer have to sit here and try to contemplate. We are to just do what God commands us to do. And there will be so much peace. There will be so much joy and so much freedom in that. There is no freedom in manipulating. There is no freedom in controlling. There's no freedom in trying to lead. That is not our job. And it's not my job to tell you what your husband should and shouldn't be doing. I am not called to speak to men. So I will not sit here and tell you what your husband should be doing and neither should you. You are to seek what the Bible says okay. that our men are to do and you are to pray that your husband be that. I am not speaking to men because there are many qualities that men need to be doing, but I'm speaking to women. I have authority to speak to women. And so that is who I'm speaking All to. Right. Your husband is not off the hook, but I'm not in authority to tell him that and neither are you. You are in authority to talk and to live out what God's word says. So your husband will be not won over by a single word that you say. Sisters, do not underestimate the power of prayer. Why is prayer not the first thing that we do? Why is talking to our Heavenly Father not the first thing that we do? If we took our frustration, if we took the thoughts and feelings that we have, and we actually took them captive. Okay, so she is basically saying that in a heterosexual relationship where the both of you have agreed to follow the Bible and be Christian, you don't get to have an opinion on your husband's actions. That's basically what it boils down to, and I disagree with it. She is sitting here saying, like, if you notice something lacking, just pray and still be a good wife and still submit no matter what because it's not your job to correct your husband. Personally, I think that as, as a partner, as a spouse – you should be doing that. Like, yes, you should pray for your partner and you should treat them with love and kindness and respect um, regardless of if they're not exactly doing what you would like them to do. And again, this applies to um, relationships where like abuse is not occurring. Yeah, if, if abuse is happening, this does not apply to that. Let's say that your spouse is, I don't know, like... Um, I really, every relationship is so different, but let's say that something that's important to you is that your husband be an example of like reading the Bible on a regular basis to your family. And you're noticing that your husband's not doing that. I think it's perfectly okay to be like, Hey, uh, we we tell our kids that this is really important to the both of us, and yet you're not doing that. Can we talk about it? Like, what's going on? Why are you not setting that example for our kids? Or even on like a, a non-religious level, if you are noticing that um, maybe you both work, and yet you're still the one who's doing most of the cooking and cleaning and grocery shopping and like taking care of the house. And you feel like your husband is not stepping up to be an equal contributor in that way. I think that's okay to be like, mm, we, we got to talk about this division of labor thing because things aren't exactly adding up. I think in a partnership, in a marriage, that's okay to talk about. You shouldn't just be like, um, well, I'm feeling really burnt out because I'm the one cooking every single day and I'm also like raising our kids or I'm also working outside of the home and I'm getting no help around the house and I'm burnt out and I'm struggling. But instead of addressing it with my husband, I'm just going to pray. Like, yeah, God could knock your husband over the head and be like, hey, get it together. And your husband could have that like realization of, oh, I'm not really pulling my weight in this sense in our relationship. But you're like, presumably, you're both adults, like you're both adults in a marriage and you have the capability to communicate with each other to work through issues. And so long story short, I think it's okay. I think it's all right to be like, mm, I don't like this thing. We should probably talk about it again with respect and love and kindness and not like an accusatory tone of you suck as a partner. Here's why, because no one's going to be receptive to that. But you should, you should feel comfortable and confident enough in your relationship to be able to talk about things that are bothering you. And if we actually 
cast all our anxieties on Christ, how much more peaceful would our relationship with our husbands be? If we took everything, if we just sat and just quietly took these frustrations to the Lord, this is how our husbands will be won over. It's not by nagging. It's not by running your mouth off. It's not by manipulating him. It's not like being like Jezebel. Jezebel is unrepentant of her sin all the way through Revelation 20. Have you read the book of Revelation, y'all? There's a whole lot that happens. Intense stuff. This world, Jezebel is dead. <laughs> it, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. But Jezebel dies in 2 Kings, which is a book in the Old Testament of the Bible. And then Revelation is the last book in the New Testament. There's a few hundred years between um, when each of those books were written. So Jezebel's not alive at the time that Revelation is being written. And when she's referenced in Revelation, it's within um, the letters to the seven churches. And those seven churches existed at like different times in history. And so um, Jezebel is referenced, but she's not like actively making choices in Revelation because she's dead. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but just for saying that, I was like, she's not alive. <laughs> is going up in flames. There is blood everywhere. Rivers, oh the my. seas turn to blood. There are plagues. It is awful what becomes of this world. And God so clearly shows his might and his authority and his power. And Jezebel is still unrepentant of her sins. Do not be like that. Do not fall into that trap. Like I said, there I feel like I'm just wetting my tongue into this and I would love to share more what it has looked like for me in a practical sense because submission is one of the hardest things for me. I will be very blunt with you. It is very difficult for me. It's something that I have to day in in day out check my heart i need to check who i am fearing i have to check my questioning against the lord it is a complete slap to the face to tell the lord that i do not trust him because i am unwilling to submit to my husband it is a complete dishonor to the lord and i am putting myself in place of leadership where i do not belong or should not be in place of so in the part two i would love to share more how this has looked like for me and how much of the unlearning i have had to do but in the Meanwhile, women, I just really want you to be in God's word and saturate yourself in this and live it out. Stamp it on your forehead and use every moment as a moment to glorify the Lord. We do all of this to bring glory for the Lord. It's not for us. It's not for our own doing. It is to bring glory to the Lord. And how beautiful would it be for our children to witness what that looks like? Live it out. Stamp My video cut me off, so I'm not sure exactly where I okay. stopped, but I want to encourage you to spend some time in the podcast. <laughs> sitting there and I'm like, what's going on? Okay, her video cut out. Gotcha. Because sometimes when I listen to my AirPod, like, it'll cut out for a second, and usually I don't miss, like, the, the greater meaning of what's going on. It's literally just, like, a second of silence, and then it comes back in. Um but that was a that was a bit of silence and I was like, are we okay? I place this week. I feel like when I go into my prayer closet, it's like a direct funnel straight to the feet of Jesus. And it is such a beautiful image. And it's so beautiful what happens when we have Jesus. We're at the feet of him, when we are praying to him, when we are talking to him, when we are conversing with him, and when we replace and move our husbands aside at the feet of Jesus. So often I think we're guilty of thinking our husband should be like Jesus, that our husband should comfort us like him, that our husbands should be blameless like him. But we did not marry Jesus. We married our husbands here on earth. And so we have a responsibility in that area. But I want to encourage you to just spend time with the Lord, spend time saturated in his word and what he says about wives. And look at what it says for a husband to do, not for you to sit here and tell your husband, well, you're, the Bible says for you to do this, 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 and this, and you're not doing that. But for you to take it to Jesus, for you to spend time in prayer and pray that your husband have wisdom, that you pray your husband love you like Jesus loved the church, that you pray these things to your husband. That is what we are called to do. So until I put out a part two of this where I will unpack what it's looked like for me to submit to my husband, because submission is something that I have had to take to the Lord over and over again. I don't 
It does not come easy to me. I don't know anyone who says submission does come easy to them. If it does, praise the Lord because that is so beautiful. But for me, this has been a stumbling block for me. This has been something that has really prevented our marriage to flourish and it's on my own mm. doing. And so I feel like the Lord has truly just taught me so much wow. about that and what that looks like day to day and what it looks that's a heavy burden to carry, her saying that like, it's her fault that their marriage hasn't flourished. That's really sad. And I I mean, if that's how she feels, then obviously she has a right to feel however she wants, but she might be putting a little bit of undue blame on herself. Looks like to apply God's word into our marriage. So in our part two, I will be kind of unpacking that and what that looks like. But sisters, until then, I just want to encourage you to read God's word and see what it says. I want you to see what unlearning you have to do. What hurt do you currently have? Take it to Jesus. He literally tells us to cast all of our fears and anxieties onto him, not to your husband's unto him. And so I want to encourage you to do that today. I want to encourage you to see what unlearning you have to do. I want you to seek God's word and see what it says. If you want somewhere to start, go to Ephesians. If you want somewhere else to go, go to First Peter and then go to Proverbs. Highlight right in your Bible. Spend time. With, take your Bible. Have your Bible be more important than your wallet. Do not walk out that door without your Bible. Do not leave your home without your Bible because this is our bread. This is our daily bread. This is our life. This is everything that we need to know. So treat it as such. I love you guys. Be blessed. Well, all right. That's part one of a two-part series on Helena's channel about submitting to your husbands. I don't know what I expected to be in that video, but I, I think we had a lot of um, good points to talk about and points of discussion to kind of go over together. And I'm definitely interested in hearing what you thought about it and whether or not you want me to react to part two. So definitely feel free to let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below if you're watching on YouTube or in the Q&A section for this episode if you are listening on Spotify. And while you're doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, that would be incredible, or leaving the podcast a rating and a review. If you've done any of those things already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you, and I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you, and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Please be kind to people, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.